Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. This week is our annual Missions and Evangelism Lectureship. And as uh, John prayed, we will be focusing on Jewish evangelism and discipleship. Today we're privileged to have as our speaker, Dr. Richard Freeman, who is the Vice President of Church Ministries and Conferences with Chosen People Ministries. Dr. Freeman was born in Brooklyn, New York, and grew up there in a traditional Jewish, though not religious, family. And through the witness of his wife, a coworker, and Chosen People Ministries, Dr. Freeman heard and responded to the gospel and accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior in 1983. God gave him a hunger to know him and his word. And in 1987, he and his wife moved to Texas to uh, attend Dallas Theological Seminary. And over the next 10 years, he served as a missionary with Chosen People Ministries, and pastored two churches. And in 1999, he assumed his position as Vice President and Director of Church Ministries and Conferences. He received an MDiv from the Conservative Baptist Seminary of the East and his Doctor of Ministry from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, Rich, we welcome you back to our campus. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Rich Freeman? Good morning. Now, how many of you, as uh, you heard Mark say, I'm from a Jewish background of thinking, that is the biggest Jewish person I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I get that a lot. Uh, one of my roles in Chosen People Ministries is to put together conferences, uh, especially in, we like to do them in theological institutions, and uh, we were privileged to be able to have this week to be able to share our hearts with you regarding Jewish evangelism and you, the future Christian leaders, hopefully we could capture your hearts regarding the importance of reaching the people through whom Jesus came. Amen? Um, as you heard a little bit of my story, one of the things that uh, during the brown bag I want to focus on is the idea of reaching people in the marketplace. Because uh, many of you, those students are also working and you're going to find yourselves meeting a Jewish person. And I would hope that as God puts on your heart the need for Jewish people to be saved, and we'll talk about that this morning, uh, that, that you would really pray that God would allow you to be a bold and effective witness of the gospel to all people, but remembering the Jewish people. While I was unable to finish at Dallas Seminary due to a number of uh, family issues that forced me to go back to New York and where I finished uh, my theological training, this was a special place for me. And one of the privileges that I had in my almost three years in Dallas Seminary was to be going to a church that Dr. Stan Toussaint was the teaching elder. And uh, every Sunday, I had the privilege of hearing Stan preach. And it was uh, really a, a blessing that uh, I don't think I've ever recaptured in any way. One of the things that Stan would do almost every week is tell a parrot joke. <laughs> and he would tell this particular parrot joke, and at the end of the parrot joke, he would say, but, and that actually has nothing to do with what I'm going to share with you this morning. <laughs> and I found myself fascinated with it, to the point that I began going to websites and you know, learning different parrot jokes so that I could do that when I preached. And, and for those, in our ministry, they know that I do that all the time. So in honor of Dr. Toussaint, <laughs> in honor of Dr. Toussaint, and I'm glad to see that he's here, I want to share this little story with you. This is a story about a young woman who comes into a veterinarian's office carrying a big bird cage, and the cage is covered, and on the cover is the name Max. She drops the cage on the examining table, and the veterinarian comes in, and he takes the cover off, and they're lying at the bottom of the cage as this big parrot, feet up in the air, rigor mortis having already set in. And the doctor looks at the woman and says, ma'am, what is it that you want me to do? The bird is obviously dead. And she said, please, doctor, there has to be something that you can do. Max is my whole life. I, I don't know how I could survive without Max. He says, ma'am, the bird is obviously dead. I don't, I don't know what else I could do. She says, please, doctor, there must be something that you can do. So he 
puts on his gloves and takes the bird out of the cage and gingerly places it down on the examining table and takes his stethoscope and begins listening for what he knows is not going to be any heartbeat, but he goes through the motions and he says, ma'am, your bird is dead. Please move on with your life, get another bird, it's okay. And she said, please, isn't there something else you can do? Please. And he says, okay, and he picks up the phone and he calls his receptionist and says, send in Charlie. And the door opens up and this big Labrador retriever comes in. And the Labrador retriever puts his paws on top of the table and with one paw kind of hits the bird this way, with another paw hits the bird the other way, looks at the doctor and shakes his head. <laughs> He said, ma'am, please accept the fact that your bird is dead. There's nothing else we can do. She says, isn't there something else? Please, anything, anything. And he says, okay. And he picks up the phone again and he says, send an Oscar. And then comes this tabby cat. And the tabby cat jumps on the table and very carefully looks at the bird from one end of the bird to the other, back and forth a couple of times looks at the doctor and shakes his head. And the doctor said, please, ma'am, please accept the fact that your bird is dead. Move on, get yourself another bird. I'm sure you'll, you'll learn to love it the way you love this one. And she took a deep breath and said, well, I guess so. I guess I could move on. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate it. He says, well, go to my receptionist and she'll hand you the bill. She goes out to the receptionist and the receptionist gives her a bill and it says $1,000. <laughs> so she comes back to the doctor. And she said, I don't understand. Why so much money? $1,000 seems ridiculous. And the doctor said, ma'am, if you would have accepted the fact that your bird was dead when you first came in, that would have been no charge. He said, once I took it out of the cage and began examining it, he said, that was $50. He said, but then we did lab work and a CAT scan, and those things cost money. <laughs> and that actually has nothing to do with what I'm going to share with you this morning. <laughs> well, why don't we pray? Well, Father God, thank you for giving us the gift of laughter, that we could just take a moment and laugh and just rejoice in who you are. Lord, as we just look at your word this morning, uh, open our eyes and our hearts to your word, that we might be doers of your word and not hearers only. Uh, that we might just look at this whole concept of Jewish evangelism, the difficulty of reaching Jewish people, and yet the biblical mandate for it. Just help us to get a balanced sense of what we need to do. And Lord, we thank you for what you'll do this week. We look forward to it and pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing for everyone involved. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just one quick bookkeeping note. You should have gotten one of these brochures. And in the brochure is a card, an involvement card. And what we would like you to do, if you are not receiving any literature from chosen people is to fill that out. And at the student center, we are going to have uh, some books for you to take. And if you hand that involvement card to the people that will be manning our book table and our display, we'd like to get into your hands a book called Isaiah 53 Explained. It's written by our president, Dr. Mitch Glazer. And we have been, as a ministry, focusing on Isaiah 53. We uh, did a conference at a Irving Bible Church and some, some faculty members from here and Southwestern and other places were involved. Uh, there's supposed to be a book coming out and uh, Daryl and I need to talk about that one. Uh, it was supposed to be out in time for this conference and for the ETS in San Francisco and now it doesn't look like that's gonna happen. But there'll be a book coming out. But we really want to focus on Isaiah 53 as a means of Jewish evangelism because you really have to share the gospel with Jewish people from the Hebrew scriptures, not from the New Testament. And also as a means of getting the church aware of this amazing prophecy written by uh, the greatest of all the Hebrew prophets, the prophet Isaiah. So 
Fill out the involvement card, bring it to our book table, and we'll be sure to give you a copy of this book for your library, okay? Now, the Apostle Paul, the Rabbi Saul of Tarsus, in the book of Romans, following eight chapters of some of the most important teaching in all of the New Testament, ends the eighth chapter with a statement. And if you would open up your Bibles to the very end of Romans chapter eight. And he writes this, he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, our Lord. An incredible statement. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. No mess ups, no bad term papers, nothing. And as Paul completed chapter eight of Romans, his typical format of his letters is following teaching comes application. And you would have expected to see application beginning in chapter nine. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he kind of takes a detour. And I believe the reason for the detour is that last statement that he made at the end of chapter eight. Nothing could separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a promise for every believer. And yet Paul anticipated a question writing to a predominantly Gentile readership in the book of Romans. He anticipated a question that was crucial, crucial in why he wrote Romans 9, 10, and 11. And the question is this. Paul, if you expect me to believe this promise, then tell me what happened to Israel. What happened? What happened to the Jews? I mean, think about this. We look back at Pentecost and the Peter's Pentecost sermon and those 3,000 souls that were saved and realize that they were probably almost all Jewish people that got saved that day. I mean, Peter was preaching to Israel. And that early church was a Jewish church based in Jerusalem, in spite of the fact that Jesus said, go and make disciples of whom? Of all nations. In essence, the Great Commission was Jesus, the risen Jesus, telling Jewish disciples that the message of the Jewish Messiah and now Savior of the world would not be for Jews only, but would be for everyone. And you know what happened in the book of Acts? They stayed in Jerusalem. And it was only after God allowed persecution to come to that church that it began going out and doing what it was told to do. Eventually, God raises up an apostle to the Gentiles. And quite frankly, it was... <laughs> to uh, make a point, I believe. That is that uh, God uses the weak things, the foolish things, to confound the mighty. Uh, I don't think anybody was chomping at the bit to be the apostle to the Gentiles back then. So God raises up this crazy rabbi, Saul of Tarsus, spewing out hatred to these Jewish believers on his way to Damascus to bring Jewish believers back to Jerusalem to deprogram them, if you will, and bring them back to the traditional Judaism of his day. And it was there on the Damascus Road that Paul had a confrontation with the risen Christ. And the world has never been the same. And now this apostle to the Gentiles, writing to a predominantly Gentile audience, I believe, has a message. In response to that question, what about the Jews? What happened to them? Why aren't there more believing? I mean, think about what was transitioning during the time of Paul as this Jewish church went out into the world. Less and less and less believers were Jewish. More and more believers were Gentiles to the point that the church kind of flipped upside down. And today, it's considered odd 
that a Jewish person would believe in Jesus. I mean, there's only about 150,000 of us in the world. Not even 1% of the total population. So Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11 answers that question. What about Israel? What happened to them? He lays out God's plan, and in the process, I believe, shares a piece of his heart with us. So let's look at, at the heart of the apostle for a few moments, beginning in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. And Paul begins this section by making a statement. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. So we begin this process of seeing Paul's heart and recognizing that it's sorrowful. His heart is broken as he thinks about the vast majority of his Jewish brethren lost apart from Christ. One of the things that you will hear over and over and over again emphasized is the fact that Jewish people like everyone else apart from Christ are lost. And maybe in a great theological institution like Dallas Seminary, that doesn't come as a surprise to you. But one of the things that we deal with on a regular basis in our ministry is what I would call hyper-Christian Zionism. Where people are so in love with Jewish people that they forget to bring the gospel to them. And somehow think that there is another way for a Jewish person to get saved apart from Christ. Well, if that's the case, then the cross is the greatest overreaction in history, if there's any other way to get saved. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I have been to way too many funerals of family members and friends and relatives and co-workers who've died without Christ. If I thought there was any way for a Jewish person to get saved apart from Christ and I could confirm it in the scriptures, I would embrace it in a minute. But the scriptures are clear. You can't read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and not recognize that Paul's heart was broken because his kinsmen, according to the flesh, as he calls them, are lost. So this whole week of evangelism, looking at Jewish evangelism, must start with a very foundational statement that Jewish people, like everyone else, apart from Christ, are lost. There's no other way to be saved. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me, who was he talking to? He was talking to Jews. There's no other way to be saved. And I have to tell you, in this day of political correctness, when we stand and unashamedly say that Everybody needs Jesus, even Jewish people. We are castigated for it, and there are some mainline churches that have called us despicable for even believing such a horrible thing. But you can't read Paul and not hear his heart. Listen to what he says in verse three. He says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. Stop and think about this for a moment. Paul is saying that if he could make a deal with God, he would be willing to trade his own salvation in if that might save his brethren. And I've read commentators who said, well, Paul's just speaking hyperbole. Baloney. Paul is so heartbroken that he would be willing to trade his own salvation. And I have to tell you, in, in the quiet times in my heart, I read this and I am very intimidated by that statement. God has given me a passion to see my people get saved. 
But I have to be honest with you, I haven't once thought about trading my salvation in. And yet clearly that's what Paul is saying here. So we begin with, with the understanding that Paul's heart is broken. It's sorrowful over the fact that his brethren according to the flesh are lost. But he has hope. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. He says, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them, for Israel, is for their salvation. So as Paul is sharing with us his broken heart for his people in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 10, verse 1, he tells us that he believes that there's hope. In fact, he is so hopeful that the most fervent prayer of his heart is to see his brethren get saved. I mean, stop for a moment, and if you could have one prayer answered by God in the affirmative, what might that be? Hopefully it's for a loved one who's lost. For Paul, it was his kinsmen according to the flesh, as he called them. And then he says in verse two, he says, for I testify about them, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Here Paul's dealing with this question, what about those righteous, zealous Jewish people? What about them? How many of you have been to Israel? If you've been to Israel and you've taken El Al, it usually happens on El Al, while you're flying as morning comes, because you usually leave late at night, some Orthodox Jewish men will gather in a part of the plane, try to get 10 men together, and they will pray. They, in fact, they pray three times a day. Three times a day, they pray. Beautiful prayers, honoring God. I remember as a young boy, learning those prayers in the, in the Hebrew prayer book. Beautiful prayers. Honoring God. I remember as a pastor, it would be hard for me to get my people to pray for three minutes a day, let alone three times a day. So how could you say that these zealous people, so zealous that they pray three times a day, that God wouldn't somehow find a way to save them? They're so zealous for God. But Paul here says their zeal for God is not in accordance with knowledge. And he explains it, verse three, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And then talking about the law, he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And I'm not going to get into a theological discussion of the word teleos, whether it means goal or whether it means termination. But obviously, obviously, there is no salvation by the law. That's clear. So Paul is saying no matter how zealous anybody trying to do a series of laws, some do's and don'ts, won't get saved because their knowledge is is flawed. They don't understand salvation by grace through faith. And it's my heartfelt belief that that's the way it always was, even before the cross. So what is Paul saying when he says, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation? Number one, he's saying that he, again, emphasizes their lostness. But secondly, and this is also something that we come up against once in a while in our ministry. He's also emphasizing that they're savable. The fact that he would pray for their salvation tells us that he believes that they are savable. I mean, you wouldn't pray for someone, for something that you know is not possible, that the Bible says is not possible. How many of you would pray for the salvation of Satan? Well, I'm glad nobody raised their hand. Wow. 
Every once in a while I ask this question in a church and people raise their hand. I mean, we know from the scriptures that Satan is not savable. We know he's lost, but he's not savable. We don't pray for his salvation. Paul is praying for their salvation because they are savable. And the fact that I can stand before you, the product of a Jewish father and a Jewish mother, tells you that Jewish people can and still do get saved. Yet, in my role as the vice president of church ministries of chosen people, we have come across pastors who have said to us, you are wasting your time. When they rejected Christ, God rejected them. They are not savable. And I want to go, well, duh. <laughs> they actually believe that, that that's part of their punishment for rejecting Christ. Well, as Paul continues in Romans 11, he deals with what I believe is a very important question. And the question is, as the church now is becoming predominantly a Gentile church, what is the role of Gentiles now? And in Paul's time, as the church was taking on the very, very Gentile flavor and culture, there still was a great commission for Gentiles, I believe, as it pertained to the Jews. And it begins in Romans 11, 11. And Paul says this, he says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall. Did they? And here he's dealing with that question, was their rejection of Jesus the first time he came permanent? And his response, in the strongest possible negative, what does he say? He says, may it never be. God forbid, in no way. But listen to this. But by their transgression, by their rejecting Jesus the first time he came, salvation has come to the Gentiles, and here's the purpose, to make them jealous. The King James says to provoke them to jealousy. To provoke them to jealousy. Paul envisioned as Gentiles were converting to Christ, and I use that word because in the context of Jewish evangelism, you never use that word with a Jewish person. You say coming to faith, believing in Jesus, but you never say converting. There is too much baggage with that word. But when it comes to Gentiles being grafted into that olive tree, it's an appropriate word. As Gentiles were converting to Christ, as Paul saw more and more Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus, his belief would be that they would be so on fire for Jesus, so in love with Jesus, and so in love with the people through whom Jesus came, that they wouldn't, couldn't help but have a burden to see Jewish people know Jesus. And their lives would provoke them to jealousy. Now I'm going to share during the brown bag time a little bit of my story uh, for those of you who are going to join me and talk about what that means, how, what it looks like to provoke someone to jealousy. Listen to what Paul says in verses uh, 13 and 14. He says, I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow... I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Paul believed that it would magnify his ministry if Gentiles would somehow have a burden to see Jewish people get saved and would somehow show that burden in their lives. Some of you are going to become pastors one day. Some of you maybe will become teachers and professors, others counselors. But in an institution like DTS, you are the leaders of tomorrow. And I have to tell you, 
as a leader of the ministry that I represent, one of our challenges, one of our challenges is to capture your generation's heart. Back in 1948, when Israel was reborn as a nation, and Dr. Walvoord began writing, and Dr. Pentecost, and people like that, that generation was so on fire for Jewish evangelism. They still are our strongest supporters. Our problem is they're getting older and older and older and going home to be with the Lord. God bless them. So what happens to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren? And some of you are here. This isn't something new. The fact that we're doing this here at Dallas Seminary this week is a blessing for us. But this isn't something new and exciting. Jewish evangelism has been around since Paul wrote Romans. <laughs> when Jesus, in the book of Acts, gives his final marching orders to his disciples, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses to me and for me. And then what does he mention? He mentions some places. He mentions Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, I go to a Southern Baptist church back in Florida where I live, and Southern Baptists, God bless them, are fond of taking the application of that and making Jerusalem your local community, and Judea the state that you live in, and Samaria the whole country, and then for the Southern Baptists, the International Mission Board goes to the ends of the earth. And that'll preach, won't it? <laughs> the problem with that is when you take that application to such an extent and forget the context, then Jewish evangelism becomes the great omission of the great commission. You forget about the Jews. Do you think for one moment that when Jesus said that, you begin in Jerusalem that he wasn't meaning continue to bring the gospel to Jewish people as you bring it to the rest of the world? As this week unfolds, I really hope that you'll take stock of where your heart is regarding the people through whom Jesus came. By pure numbers, we don't stack up too well. You can go to Asia, and there are three billion Chinese and more than one billion people in India and 500 million in Indonesia, and there is never enough missionaries to cover that many people. 15 million Jews, six and a half in the US, almost five in Israel, and another million in the former Soviet Union, another million in Central and South America, and some, some in Europe. Numbers-wise, we don't stack up. But it is a biblical imperative that I believe with all my heart still holds true today. And Romans 11, 11, for those of you who are Gentiles, and by the way, how many of you are Gentiles? If you're not sure, you are. <laughs> Romans 11:11, 11, 11, quite frankly, is your great commission. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. As this week unfolds, I pray that we'll capture your heart and that you might be a bold witness of Jesus both to the Jew and to the Gentile, proclaiming the message of life to a lost and dying world that desperately needs, it, needs to hear it. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your great faithfulness. Lord, uh, I am overwhelmed 
at the way you have blessed me, my life, and my ministry, and even given me the privilege of preaching here this morning. So I pray for Dallas Seminary and the impact it has had not only in my life, but in people all around the world. I pray that that would continue, that you would bless it, and bless Mark and the leaders and all the faculty here and those who aren't here to continue to proclaim boldly this gospel message. And Lord, for those students that I could so identify with who are thinking of midterms and all the tests that are coming up and the books that they have to read, Lord, don't allow them to get overwhelmed with that and forget about spending time with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your great faithfulness to us. And Lord, may we capture their hearts this week for the cause of Jewish evangelism. We give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.